This is the 16th video in a series devoted to complex analysis. And after doing a quick review of the convergence of series of complex numbers, most of which follows immediately from convergence of series of real numbers, we'll look at sequences and series of complex valued functions. So let's start with a definition. So given a sequence of complex numbers, a sub n as n goes from one to infinity, we say that the sum as n goes from one to infinity of a sub n converges to a number s, which is a complex number, if the sequence of partial sums also converges to s. So here we've got s sub m is the sum from n to or from n equals one to m of a sub n. And then in a previous video we did sequences of complex numbers. So this pushes the convergence of a series to just the notion of the convergence of a convergence of a sequence, which we have already covered. And maybe I won't do this in this video, but I urge you to maybe check out some review material about standard results of real series. So you can look at like maybe it carefully done as in a real analysis class, or even just the results that you learn in calculus two would probably be enough to review for what we'll, what we will do. Okay, so let's start with a fairly straightforward result, but it's nice and it gives us an idea for how dealing with series of complex numbers is different than dealing with series of real numbers. And that is, we'll show that if the series, the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of a sub n absolutely converges, then it just regularly converges. So if it converges absolutely, then notice that means that the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the modulus of a n converges. So I guess I haven't carefully written down what it means for a series to absolutely converge for complex numbers, but this is maybe like what the logical definition would be. Okay, so we have that converges. Okay, so another thing that we know, and this is like maybe from one of the first days of this class, is that we have the following inequality. The absolute value of the real part of a sub n is less than or equal to the modulus of a sub n. So let's notice I was careful to say absolute value over here on the left hand side because I'm taking the absolute value of a real number. Whereas on the right hand side, I said modulus because I'm taking the modulus of a complex number. So now let's notice that that tells us that we've got a nice series of positive real numbers given by this. So we have the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the modulus of a n plus the real part of a n is a series with positive terms. So let's maybe put parentheses here so that we see that's within the sum. And why is that? Well, notice since the modulus of a n is bigger than or equal to the real part, that means if this complex number is totally real and negative, at worst, we just cancel this out to zero. So that kind of proves the thing that I said verbally. So let's maybe put a little box around this or over this and write that out. So this has only non-negative terms. And that's because we have this inequality right here, which maybe we could expand that out if we wanted to, to something like this negative modulus a n is less than or equal to the real part of a n, which is less than or equal to the modulus of a n. Maybe that makes it a little bit clearer. But now we can do some comparisons. Notice we can include an absolute value here and we push it larger. So let's do this. So this sum, which like we said, has only non-negative terms, is less than the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the modulus of a n plus the absolute value of the real part of a n. Okay, good. And that's because the absolute value of the real part will be bigger than or equal to the real part. That's pretty clear. But then we can use this inequality one more time to put these two together and maybe replace this one right here with the modulus of a sub n making something larger. Then combining those, we see that this is less than or equal to two times the sum as n goes from one up to infinity of the modulus of a n. 
Great, which converges. So our assumption, kind of our starting assumption is that this thing converges. So let's write that. Okay, so we have this thing convergence. But now we have a series of non-negative terms and each of those negative non-negative terms is less than another series of non-negative terms which converges. So that means that this guy right here that we've been working with also converges by the comparison test. So this is also converges. And this is just the comparison te test for real valued series because we're taking the modulus and the real part. We only have real valued series right here. But now we can maybe extract this real part of a sub n from this series and we'll see that we get the sum of the real part also converges. So let's see how we can do that. So we have now the sum as n goes from one up to infinity of the real part of a sub n will be equal to the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the modulus of a sub n plus the real part of a sub n minus the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the modulus of a sub n. And we're only able to do this because it was given that this guy converged and we just proved that this guy converged. So that means we can push them together and pushing them together cancels out that modulus and we get this real part of a sub n. So like I said, this right hand side converges. So this guy over here also converges. So let's write that down. So that means this converges. But now using essentially the same idea, so same idea implies the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the imaginary part of a sub n also converges. In fact, it's exactly the same. We just replace all of these real parts with imaginary parts. But now we can write the sum a sub n is equal to the sum of the real part of a sub n plus i times the sum of the imaginary part of a sub n. And so since we're adding two convergent series, we get a convergent series. So that, that means that this converges as well. So let's see what we got. We started with our assumption that the sum of the modulus of a sub n converges. In other words, of this series was an absolutely convergent series. And we ended down here with this series is like a normally convergent series. Okay, so let's get rid of this. And just, I wanna reiterate that maybe review these standard result results from real series from calculus to a real analysis if you need to. And now we're gonna jump into sequences and series of functions. Okay, now we're ready to look at sequences and series of functions. So let's look at a definition. So let's suppose for natural numbers n, we have a function which I'll call f sub n going from a subset of the complex numbers a to the complex numbers. So this is a complex valued function. Then we say that f n converges to f pointwise on the set a if for all z in a, the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of z converges to f of z. And that uh, limit exists and is finite. So notice we're fixing this z value inside of our set A before we're taking the limit. And that's important because after fixing this z value, this is just a limit of numbers. And we know how to deal with limits of sequences of numbers. Okay, good. So now let's look at a couple of examples. And these examples will come from real variables because they're just easier to visualize and they give us an idea for what we're going for. So let's start with this sequence of functions f sub n going from the unit interval to r. Well, notice that the unit interval is a subset of the complex plane and r is a subset of c as well. So you can really imagine this as one of these, but it's a very special one of these. And how this is defined is f sub n of x equals x to the n. Okay, so let's maybe draw a couple pictures of this real quick. So let's say that's our graph. Let's say maybe this is the point one. Obviously, this is the point zero. So notice f sub one will just be this line right here. So that's f sub one of x, or maybe the graph of f sub one of x. So it's just a line. f sub two is a parabola. So we'll have growth like that. 
what's f sub three? So that'll be x cubed. But notice if we're cubing a number between zero and one, we'll end up with something smaller than if we square it. For example, one half cubed is one eighth versus one half squared, which is one quarter. So maybe f cubed looks something like that. And then you can extend this on and on and on, and you'll see that this is always dipping down. So if we were to think about the picture of the limit here, it's like pretty clear that it would look something like this. So at zero, it would be zero. And then it would be zero for everything between zero and one. But at one, it will not be equal to zero. It will in fact be equal to one. And that's because one to the n is equal to one for all values of n. So we get a function that's something like this. And so notice that means that our function f, which is the limit, can be piecewise defined as zero if x is on the half open interval zero to one, and it's equal to one if x is equal to one. So let's notice that all of these f sub n's are continuous, but the limit is not continuous. So that's important. If we take a pointwise limit of continuous functions, we do not necessarily get a continuous function. But if we don't necessarily get a continuous function, that means we don't necessarily get a differentiable function by taking limits of differentiable functions and then so on and so forth. Okay, so that points towards something in complex analysis, which would be a pointwise limit of analytic functions will not necessarily give us an analytic function. Okay, and that really like points towards maybe a stronger definition than pointwise convergence, which we'll get to after this next example. Okay, so let's define some new functions, g sub n from r to r to be defined in this piecewise form as follows. g sub n of x is equal to one over n minus absolute value of x over n squared, where x is between negative n and n, and it's equal to zero otherwise. So let's maybe draw a picture of what's going on here. I think this is a pretty interesting function. So let's put one and negative one on the line here, two and negative two, and then three and negative three. I think that'll give us an idea of what's going on. 3 and negative 3. Okay, so for n equals 1, we have 1 minus the absolute value of x. That means it goes through the point 1 along the y-axis. So this would be like g of 1. And I'll just draw this portion of it, but it's 0 everywhere else. So it's that little tent that's kind of above the origin. And then let's see what we get for n equals 2. So for n equals 2, we'll get 1 half minus absolute value of x over 4. So that means the height is a half right here. So we get this tent, which is wider. But although it's wider, it is shorter. And then for n equals 3, we get something similar, but we have a 1 third. So we get something like that. So the important thing here is the area under all of these is equal to one. And you can calculate that pretty easily just with the area of a triangle. So notice the height of this is one over n, and then the base is equal to two times n. So that's how we have constructed this. But that tells us that for all n, 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 we have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g sub n of x dx is equal to 1. Whereas if we're taking the limit here, what happens? I think it's pretty clear when we take the limit here, this descends down just to the real axis. So we get the constant function 0. So we have something like that. So note, g n of x converges to g of x, which is equal to the zero function. So I won't check that carefully, but I think that's pretty clear. But that tells us that the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g sub n of x dx is equal to one, because there we're calculating the integral first and then the limit. Whereas the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the limit as n goes to infinity of g sub n of x dx is equal to zero because there we're calculating the 
inside before we're calculating the integral. In other words, the limit before the integral. And these are clearly not equal to each other. One is not equal to zero. These are definitely continuous functions, but this point-wise convergence of continuous functions does not satisfy the condition that we can bring the limit inside of the integral. And so it stands to reason a point-wise convergence of analytic functions will also not allow us to bring a limit within the integral. So that gives us more motivation that we should have a stronger definition for convergence, which is maybe a little better than point-wise convergence. And so let's get that on the board. So here's our stronger definition. So we say that the sequence of functions f sub n converges to f uniformly if for all epsilon bigger than zero, we have an n in the natural numbers, such that if n is bigger than or equal to this capital N, we have the modulus of f of z minus f sub n of z is less than epsilon, and this is true for all z in A. So let's notice what happened here. This n, which was built off of this epsilon, does not depend on our point z. Whereas before, when we looked at pointwise convergence, if we were to rewrite this definition of pointwise convergence using an epsilon n definition, we would see that the n would be allowed to be dependent on both epsilon and z. And that's because we've invoked this z before talking about this like size of the difference, whereas down here we've invoked it after. Okay, so just to reiterate, up here with a given epsilon, the n that you take might depend on your choice of z as well as that epsilon, but down here for a given epsilon, the n that you take will only depend on that epsilon and then it will work maybe perfectly for all z in a. So it turns out this is the definition to maybe make those things that didn't work on the last board work now. So in other words, we have a uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous and we're able to bring a limit inside of an integral. So let's prove each of those. So let's look at this first theorem. Let's suppose that fn converges to f uniformly on a and each fn is continuous. Then we'll prove that f is continuous. So this was probably proven, a in, proven in a real analysis class. And the proof is essentially exactly the same, except I'll just use the word modulus instead of absolute value. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's say we are given some epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take an n in n such that we have the following inequality. So the modulus of f of z minus f sub n of z is less than epsilon over three. So we're allowed to make this as small as we want, so we'll make it epsilon over three for that given epsilon. Okay, and let's reiterate the fact that this is true for all values of z in A. So next up, what we'd like to do is take a delta bigger than zero, such that if we have the absolute value of, or I should say the modulus of z minus z naught is less than delta, then the modulus of f of z minus f of z naught is, or f sub n of z minus f sub n of z naught is less than epsilon over three. And this is for some fixed z naught in A. Great. So why are we able to do that? Well, this is the condition of f sub n being continuous. Okay, so that's looking good. And then we need one sort of like bonus fact. Let's also notice that we have the following. The modulus of f evaluated at z naught minus f sub n evaluated at z naught is also less than epsilon over three. And that's because this is true for all z in a. Okay, now we wanna just put all of these things together. So let's maybe make our calculation our calculation, the modulus of f of z minus f of z naught. So that's going to be less than or equal to, using the triangle inequality, the modulus of f of z minus f sub n of z, and then plus the modulus of f sub n of z minus f sub n of z naught, 
and then finally plus the modulus of f of z naught minus the modulus of f sub n of z naught. So again, that's by the triangle inequality. So essentially what we did is we add and, added and subtracted some things inside of this, like this term and this term, and then let's see this term and this term. Maybe we would really flip this one, one around, but since we're in the modules, we're okay. And then split them up using the triangle inequality. But let's notice that each of those is less than epsilon over three. So this is less, less than epsilon over three plus epsilon over three plus epsilon over three, which is equal to epsilon. So let's see what we did. We were given an arbitrary epsilon. And from that arbitrary epsilon, we found a delta so that the modulus of f of z minus f of z naught was less than epsilon. But that's, that's exactly the condition that we need for the continuity of f. Okay, so let's look at our next result, which has to do with the integral of some uniformly convergent functions. So as promised, our next result involves uniformly convergent se sequences of functions and integrals. So let's let C be a subset of complex numbers, which is a piecewise smooth curve. And then we've got a sequence of sequence. And then we have a sequence of complex functions f sub n converging uniformly to f. Then the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral over this curve of f sub n of z dz is equal to the integral over this curve of f of z dz. Maybe to really hammer this home, notice this is equal to the integral over this curve of the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n z dz. So in fact, what we're doing here is like bringing the limit inside of the integral. So notice this has to do with integrals in the complex plane. But if our curve was in fact just the real axis, then this becomes a theorem about what's happening on the real line. So that's kind of nice. All right, so let's introduce some notation. So let's set L equal to the length of our curve C. Then given some epsilon bigger than zero will take a natural number n, so n, 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 such that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, then the modulus of f of z minus f sub n of z is less than epsilon over L. And this is going to be for all z in C. Okay, so we can make the difference there as small as we want. We want to make it smaller than epsilon over L, and that can hold for a single n for all z and c because we have uniform convergence. And now we're like essentially done other than just like a little inequality calculation. So let's make that. So let's look, look at the modulus of the integral of the curve f of z dz and then minus the integral over the same curve of f sub n of z dz. So we have that. But now we can bring that modulus inside of the integral and push the integral together using something that's like the triangle inequality for integrals. So this is going to be less than or equal to the integral over c of the modulus of f of z minus f sub n of z dz. But now we can apply the inequality that we got. So this is going to be less than the integral over C of epsilon over L dz. But that's just the integral of a constant. So the integral of a constant will be that constant times the length of the curve. But recall that the length of the curve was L. So this is equal to L times epsilon over L, which is epsilon. That's exactly what we needed. Notice. That's what we have here. So we have the difference of these integrals is less than epsilon. For n bigger than or equal to n, that's exactly the condition for this limit to be what we've written up here. So now let's look at a nice corollary to this involving analytic functions and how they pass through uniform convergence. All right, so now we've got a result which is firmly within complex analysis, and that is we're talking about analytic functions instead of just continuous functions. 
So let's suppose that a sequence of complex valued functions f sub n converges to f uniformly on a domain d, and each of these f sub n's is analytic, then so is the limiting function f. I'd like to point out here that we're no longer on an arbitrary set like we are over here. We're on a domain. Recall that that was an open set of the complex numbers that was connected, so a connected open set. Okay, so we're gonna use, we're gonna prove this using some previous results. So let's in fact use Morera's theorem, which is kind of a really nice way of showing that something is analytic. So let's start by supposing that we have R, which is a rectangle within D. And furthermore, the precise statement of Morera's theorem says that it could be a rectangle which has sides parallel to the coordinate axes. So we could draw a picture if we wanted to. So let's say this right here is our domain D, and then our rectangle would maybe be something like this. So this is R. Okay, nice. Now let's recall that if we can show the integral over that rectangle, or the boundary of that rectangle is equal to zero, then we have an analytic function. Okay, so let's do that. So we've got the integral over the boundary of the rectangle of f of z d z. So now we can use the previous theorem to rewrite that as the limit of the integral of the sequence of. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral over the boundary of R of f of z d z. So let's maybe point that out. That's the exactly previous theorem that we just got done proving. Okay, nice. But now we're integrating, sorry, that should be f sub n. But now we're integrating analytic functions over bounded closed curves, but any integral of an analytic function over a closed curve is equal to zero by Cauchy's theorem. So this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the number zero. And like I said, this is by Cauchy's theorem. Okay, but that, clearly gives us zero. And then the fact that we get zero for this value right here means that F is analytic by, let's recall we said Morera's theorem. So this is a nice result. So we've got uniform convergence. So the uniform convergence of a analytic function produces an analytic function. Okay, so now let's kind of boost this result to not only the uniform convergence of the analytic function, but also derivatives of an analytic function. So let's maybe get rid of this and we'll look at that result. Now we've got a bit of a technical result that actually gives us quite a bit of information. So let's suppose that f sub n is analytic on a disk centered at z naught with radius capital R. So I've drawn this picture right here. So this is the disk centered at z naught with radius capital R, so that's in peach color. Then we also know that each of these f n's, and then we know that f n converges to f uniformly. And then we'll show that for all little r less than this big r and m bigger than or equal to one, the nth derivative of f sub n converges uniformly to the nth derivative of f on this smaller disk, where the smaller disk can be really any size we want as long as it is less than capital R. So I've drawn the smaller disk down here in yellow. Okay, so let's maybe get to it. So let's first suppose that we have zero, which is less than or equal to little r, which is less than capital R, like we have in the picture over there. And then we wanna fix a number between those. So let's fix an r prime that is between little r and big R. So it's something like that right there. Okay, so if we were to include that in our picture over here, we would maybe have something like this. So we've got another radius here, and this radius right here is r prime. So let's notice it's between our little r and our big r. Okay, 
So now let's use the Cauchy integral formula to look at the nth derivatives of our function f as well as one of our terms from our sequence of functions evaluated at a point z which is inside of this yellow circle. Okay, so let's do that. So we'll look at the modulus of the nth derivative of f evaluated at z minus the nth derivative or the nth derivative of f sub n evaluated at z. Like I said, by the Cauchy integral formula as well as the inequality which allows us to bring a modulus inside of the integral that's like I've said a couple times today the triangle inequality for integrals this is less than or equal to m factorial over 2 pi and then the integral over this circle w minus z naught uh, is equal to r prime so let's maybe like underline that in green because that's our green circle over there. And then inside here, we have the modulus of f of w minus f sub n of w over, let's see, w minus z to the m plus one dw. Great. So like I said, we would get equality here if this modulus was outside of everything by the Cauchy integral formula, but then applying that inequality result involving integrals, we can bring it inside like that. Okay, but now the next thing we'd like to do is take this modulus to the numerator and the denominator. So let's do that. So this is going to be equal to m factorial over 2 pi and then the integral over this same circle. So that's going to be the modulus of z minus z naught or w minus z naught is equal to r prime. And then we have the modulus of f of w minus f sub n of w all over the modulus of w minus z to the m plus one power dw. And now we want to get to like choosing an n to go with a specific epsilon. So let's see maybe how we might do that. And that has to do with the structure of what's going on with inside of this integral as, as well as the circumference of what's going on around this green circle. So it turns out that you need kind of a technical idea here. So let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero. We wanna make this less than epsilon, but in order to do that, we need to look at a new object, which I'll call epsilon prime. And this is going to be r prime minus r to the m plus 1 times epsilon over m factorial times r prime, like that. And then we'll take a capital N, which is a natural number, such that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, then the modulus of f of w minus f sub n of w is less than this epsilon prime. And that's possible to do because we have uniform convergence here. Okay, nice. So that means we can take all of this right here and replace it with epsilon prime giving us an inequality. And then we just have to get a handle on the size of this thing in the denominator. So notice that our W value is occurring along this green circle. So let's maybe put it right here on the green circle. So that's our W. And then our z value is occurring inside of that yellow circle. Well, let's notice that the closest that z can come to w is like right next to it like this. So this is maybe the minimum distance. But notice that minimum distance is exactly, let's see, r prime minus r. So that tells us the modulus of w minus z is bigger than or equal to r prime minus r. But then from there, we can maybe reciprocate that and we get one over the modulus of w minus z is less than or equal to one over r prime minus r. And from that, we can kind of see where we're getting this r prime minus r to the m plus one here. That means we can replace all of this right here with r prime minus r to the m plus one, and we push the inequality in the right direction by our argument over there. So this is starting to look good. So that means all of this is gonna be less than or equal to, let's see, we have epsilon prime times m factorial over two pi times r prime minus r, 
and then the integral over this circle of just the constant function one. But the integral over the circle of the constant function one just gives us the circumference of the circle, which is two pi times the radius. So in this case, the radius is r prime. So we have two pi times r prime here. But now, by the way, we set epsilon prime equal to this crazy thing, the epsilon prime will get canceled down by everything over there just to epsilon. So that means this is equal to epsilon. But now looking at what we have, we have the difference between the, the nth derivative of our limit function evaluated at z minus the nth derivative of our, of our function f sub n for a suitably large value n is in the end less than, this should be a strict less than epsilon. But that's exactly what we need to show this uniform convergence since this z was chosen arbitrarily. Okay, so let's get rid of this and we'll end with some warm-up problems. So I've got two warm-up problems for you. So the first has to do with the real valued function. So let's show that the sequence of functions f sub n equals x to the n over 1 plus x to the n converges pointwise, but not uniformly on the interval from 0 to infinity. Then our next warm-up problem has to do with a very famous function called the Riemann zeta function. And that Riemann zeta function is defined in terms of zeta of z equals the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the z. And so you can think of this as like a sequence of partial sums if you want to think about it as a sequence of or a limit of a sequence of functions if you'd like to. So your goal is to show that this converges uniformly for all z where the real part of z is strictly bigger than 1. So notice that if z is equal to 1, then we get the harmonic series, which we know does not converge. Then, since it uniformly converges, maybe you could like find its derivative given the fact that we have a sequence, or in this case, a series of functions that have a derivative. Okay, that's a good place to stop.